All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual program today, Effective Communication Strategies. I'm Sariana, the Adult Services Librarian at the San Anselmo Public Library. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library through Town Books and the Library of Parcel Tax for sponsoring this program and all library programs. Technology can be very fickle, and I'd like to thank you all in advance for your patience and understanding during this program. We will be recording the program today, and I will send out the link to everyone who registered either later today or early tomorrow. If you have a question during the presentation, please use the chat box or the Q&A box on Zoom. We will answer questions um, at the end of each segment in the presentation, as well as at the end of the program. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Ariana Myers. Ooh, yay, Ooh, yay. So, Thank you, Sariana, and um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Effective Communication Strategies program sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and I am Ariana Myers. I am a, a volunteer community educator with the Alzheimer's Association. So today, um, we're going to explore how communication takes place when someone is living with not just Alzheimer's, but really any form of dementia. And um, by the end of today's program, you should be able to explain the communication changes that take place through the course of the disease, um, decode the verbal and behavioral messages delivered by someone who is living with dementia, and um, ideally identify some strategies to connect and communicate um, at each stage of the disease. So before we get started, um, let's talk about what we mean when we say communication. So communication is more than just talking and listening. It's really about sending and receiving messages. And we can do that through our attitude, our tone of voice, our facial expressions, our body language. Um, communication is really a way to express who we are and how we relate to each other. Now, when um, someone's brain is changing with Alzheimer's disease or, or another dementia related progression, people do lose the ability to speak and decode language in the usual ways. So the better we can understand these changes that are taking place to that person's brain, the better we can connect with people who are living with Alzheimer's or other dementias throughout the course of the disease. So when we think of, um, of Alzheimer's in particular, um, we tend to divide uh, the, the course of the disease into three stages. So the early or mild stage, um, the middle or moderate stage, and the late or severe stage. And the changes that happen with communication from stage to stage actually um, are quite significant changes that take place. Uh, so as we mentioned before, um, as Alzheimer's or other dementias progress, people do lose their ability to communicate their thoughts and feelings through words. Um, and then uh, equally, they lose the ability to understand the words that are being spoken to them. However, they do maintain a sense of self throughout all stages of the disease. So that means that, that those characteristics that make that person unique will remain a part of him or her throughout the disease. And uh, so in that sense, connecting with that person's self is really the key to effective communication um, and staying connected and giving him or her a voice uh, in, in their, own, um, their own care as the disease progresses. So in the early stage, um, there may only be just a few noticeable changes in the person's ability to communicate with words. There may be no changes that you really notice at all. And so what we really want to focus on in the early stage is um, asking that person how they would be um, like to help with words, knowing that there are gonna be these changes taking place uh, in the future. Uh, and then in the middle stage, um, you know, the language abilities start to diminish as the disease progresses and communication uh, moves from easy conversation to relying more on behaviors. That's what we tend to see in the middle stage. And then in the very late stage of the, the disease, uh, we're very much less relying on words and more relying on emotions and the five senses to connect. So as care partners, as caregivers, 
you're the one who's going to adjust the way that you communicate and maintain connections with the person throughout the, the disease. And remember that the essence or self of that person continues. So respect the person as the adult that, that he or she is and um, adjust your communication based on what is meaningful to that person today, no matter what the stage of the disease. Okay, so we're gonna go through stage by stage. Um, in the early stage or the mild stage, as we mentioned, you may or may not see changes in the way the person communicates. Um, there may be, uh, for some people, a shift in, in the ease uh, of their words or conversations. So some of the more common uh, changes you may notice are listed here. Um, they include difficulty finding the right words, um, because of that difficulty, the person may take longer to speak or respond. Um, and then as, as a result of that, they may find themselves withdrawing from conversations um, where they're not able to keep up with the pace of the conversation. And then um, something else that gets affected is what we call executive function. So the person may also be struggling with um, some more complex decision making or problem solving that they've been able to handle in the past. Um, other things you may see, they, they may react more emotionally than they had in the past. Um, they may try to avoid um, discussing the disease and its impact. Um, that's, that's a response that some people have um, because they're having emotional difficulty adjusting to the diagnosis. And um, you know whether or not you're noticing any of these changes, what, what we really want to emphasize is that communication in this early stage is really crucial. Um, this is the period in which everyone involved is adjusting to the diagnosis. Everyone's having thoughts and feelings about the changes that are in store. And what we'd like you to, to know is that um, denial is kind of a part or a reaction of the, to the disease for some. Some people are on the other side. They, they get really overwhelmed by, by the emotions. So everyone's different. Everyone reacts differently. Um, but what, what we can say is that you're gonna have a better chance to come to terms with a diagnosis, diagnosis and the emotions that everyone is feeling by talking about it and expressing your connection with each other. That's gonna help you both accept the diagnosis and move forward and try to discover ways to live positive, fulfilling lives together. And communication throughout the process also brings closeness that's gonna help everyone um, adjust more easily as the disease progresses. Okay, in our first video, Martha Tierney uh, from the Alzheimer's Association's home office tells us about how to be helpful in the early stage. Communicating in the early stages of dementia with the person with the disease is important. Um, at that time, you still have language as a tool, so you can learn things about what they might prefer as the disease progresses. Uh, for example, as the disease progresses, a person might have difficulty finding words. Caregivers often struggle to know what to do in that moment. Early on in the disease, you can ask. You can say, you know, if you ever have trouble coming up with the word, would you rather that I jump in and give you the word, or do you want me to wait and allow you some time so you can find it on your own? Okay. Communicating in the early stages. Of Sorry, I don't know why that's, oh, there we go. Apologies. Communicating in the early stages of dementia. There we go. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Um, okay, so as uh, Martha described, um, that um, one of the best ways to ensure that you're helping someone in the early stage of the disease can, is really just to ask them directly. So if a person is struggling with, to find the right word, um, you can ask them whether it feels better to them for you to supply the word, or um, would they prefer to have you wait patiently um, for them to try and find the word themselves. And um, there's other ways to kind of facilitate um, effective communication in this early stage uh, by keeping your sentences clear and um, direct, straightforward. And that's gonna help someone 
avoid feeling lost in the conversation, you know, by maximizing the, um, the, the chances of them understanding what's going on. So shorter sentences can make your meaning clear. Um, avoid long explanations and really try to take your cue from the person that you're communicating with, uh, but be very careful to, to not talk down to him or her. Uh, note that it may take longer for that person to find words or put, put thoughts together and express them. So really you should get into the habit of starting to allow extra time for conversations, just generally speaking. And, and that's gonna help um, not have someone feel pressured or rushed. And remember that you know these conversational needs are gonna change over time. So um, in the early stage, while the person does still have the ability to, to communicate verbally and, and describe what they want, then this is the opportunity for them to have their voice heard. So, um, and that's part of what we say when we say we want to meet the person where they are in, in the stage of the disease today. Um, we want you to meet them where they are regardless of what stage they're in. Uh, but in the early stage, you can really maximize the uh, potential to, to communicate verbally. Uh, be sure to include the person in any conversations um, if they want to be included, especially, especially if those conversations are going to have an effect on his or her future. Um, including that person can be empowering and engaging to them. Okay, some other things to keep in mind. Um, don't make assumptions about the person's ability to communicate just because they have a diagnosis uh, of Alzheimer's or another dementia. Um, everyone is affected differently. Everyone progresses through the disease differently. So uh, the best way to know how someone is doing is to speak directly to that person. Um, and explore, you can explore which method of communication is more, most comfortable for them. So someone may prefer a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, some people may prefer to, for example, um, write a letter or use email where they have plenty of time to um, kind of uh, compose their thoughts and words and, and type them in with, with no time pressure. Um, some people would like to talk on the phone. Some people, again, just prefer being in person. Um, and it's, it is okay to laugh. You know, sometimes humor can lighten the mood and it can make communication easier. Uh, but whatever's going on, it's really important to be honest and frank about your feelings. Um, don't pull away. This, your friendship and your support are, are very important to the person who has dementia. So um, that's our, uh, our section on early stage. Um, you know, just really want to emphasize the importance of communication in this stage for, for planning purposes and to really give the person with the diagnosis a chance to have their voice heard. Uh, are there any questions, Sariana? Uh, so far, there's no questions in the chat or Q&A. Anyone has any questions, feel free to add them while Ariana is talking. We can answer them uh, at the end of each section. I think you can continue. We can just keep on going. Great. OK, so we're moving on to talk about the middle stage. And um, this is where you're really very likely to start to see changes in communication. Um, if you notice some changes in the early stage of the disease, they're going to be more pronounced in the middle stage, or if you hadn't noticed something before, you're certainly going to start to see it now. So the changes listed here are, are kind of typical, um, increased difficulty finding the right words. Um, as a result, a kind of reliance on using familiar words that are easily found and then using them over and over again. And that's kind of for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the one of them is that, that the person is going to have difficulty finding um, less frequently used words. And so they'll rely on those familiar words more repeatedly. But um, something else to just be aware of is that the loss of memory that a person with Alzheimer's or other dementias um, experiences tends to affect short term memory first. So you may find yourself um, in uh, hearing a com or repeating a conversation that just took place because the person um, has literally forgotten uh, the communication that had happened just a moment before. 
Um, if a person is having trouble finding a word, they may kind of invent new ways to describe those familiar things. So um, they can't remember the word for wristwatch, but they might say hand, clock, something like that. Um, people tend to lose their train of thought, um, get lost in the middle of a conversation. And that's another reason to try and keep the conversations direct and straightforward. Uh, and then again, because of all of these difficulties, the person may simply start speaking less frequently and, and uh, participating less in conversations. Um, and then the big hallmark change that you see uh, in the middle stage is that communication can often take place through more through behavior rather than through words. So um, some other I, things that you might find, a uh, person might have trouble organizing their words logically. Um, they might start reverting to speak in a native language and that hails back to what I had mentioned before. So the progression, um, the loss of memory kind of goes backward in time. So you lose your short-term memory and, um, and then the memory loss goes further and further back. And so toward the end of the disease or, or the, the, the memories that stick around are the ones that have been in the, um, you know, in the memory system the longest. So some people may revert to speaking in a native language uh, because that's the language that they've known for longer. And then you may also see behavioral changes, you may start using curse words when they hadn't done it before. Uh, and then something you also see, which is related to this idea of communicating through behavior more than words, um, people will start relying on gestures rather than speaking out loud. Um, some other effects are, um, you know, following a conversation can be difficult, if, especially if it's a complex topic. Um, in a TV program, similarly, they may have trouble following the storyline in a TV program. Um, and then remember what we had said before, it's not just the loss of ability to find the right words to speak, but also the loss of the ability to understand what other people are saying. Um, so when here then we're gonna talk about um, when we, you know, the, the fact that we're gonna be relying on behaviors more than words to communicate, that's really what we're gonna discuss uh, in more detail in the rest of this section. But before we move on, I just want to <clears throat> address the, the, the line at the bottom, consult a doctor when you notice major or sudden changes. So when you have a progressive disease like Alzheimer's, the changes tend to take place gradually and at a relatively um, steady pace. If there is a change that has happened more or less overnight where suddenly the person is much more confused, um, their dementia has gotten much worse and it's happened re really, really quickly. It may be that there's a physical condition or a medication that is causing that change in the ability to communicate. Um, typical, uh, very, very common example is urinary tract infections. So people with Alzheimer's are actually prone to, to uh, getting ur urinary tract infections. And the symptoms of a UTI uh, are very... Um, they actually resemble dementia in a lot of ways. So again, back to just this, this idea that if the change has been very dramatic and sudden, then you, you really should go see a doctor because there may be a UTI or there may be some other situation involving medications um, that can be actually cleared up and, and to help that person kind of get back to a more normal state of functioning. Okay, um, in this, our next video, Beverly is going to share advice that she gives to caregivers as a support group facilitator. I would advise couples, and I usually do advise the caregiver who comes to the group and is caring for a spouse, that you take your time. Always count to three before you respond because it gives you time to think about your answer and what's going on. Generally in a marital dispute, it's quick, it's, it's back and forth, you're quick to give an answer. When they've been diagnosed, to sit back and say, okay, you're supposed to be the one that's reasonable here. Let's change how we do this because there's only one thing you can control and that's you. You cannot control them and their process. Okay, so Beverly made some really good points there. Um, 
it's really important to take your time when responding to someone with dementia. We've mentioned before that um, it's a really good habit to get into to simply start to allow more time for conversations to take place. But the other side of it is that um, it can be frustrating, um, you know, as a caregiver, it's, it's not easy. And so the, it's really important to try and stay calm. So that little, you know, one, two, three before approaching a situation uh, can be a very um, helpful and help, uh, help kind of diffuse what could otherwise be um, an escalating situation. And, you know, you can't expect the person who's living with the disease um, to, to, you know, act the way that they did in the past and, and be reasonable all the time. It's, it, it's, that's just, that's just the reality of the matter. Um, if something you're doing isn't getting the desired response, um, then try to focus on what's going on in that situation and what you can change to try and try and alter the response. I'm Okay, um, so here's some of our more kind of practical uh, um, approaches to keep in mind. So you want to approach uh, the person gently. Um, not, so as you know, to minimize the, the, the chance of startling or, 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 um, or you know, otherwise disturbing them. Um, it's important to come from the front. And there's a really specific reason for that, which is that um, as the disease progresses, that people tend to lose their ability to, uh, their peripheral vision. So they uh, aren't actually able to see you coming to them if you're coming from the back or from the side. Um, but if you come from the front, you have the most chance of the person seeing you walking toward them, recognizing that you're approaching them. And then um, you can do that by also announcing who you are. Um, use their name, use your name, okay? So, hi, John, it's your daughter, Martha. Um, I'm coming to, to talk to you. And um, then that, that just helps kind of ground the situation and, and remind the person of, of who you are. Um, try to come to them at eye level, by the way, because again, if, if someone is sitting down and, and you're standing above them, then that can feel intimidating and, and might um, escalate an emotional situation in a way that you don't want to. Um, you can use touch actually to, to try and show that you care and, and make that contact. So take the person's hand gently and hold it as, you, as you're starting to talk to them. Um, and then in the course of talking to them, don't criticize, uh, don't correct, um, don't impose your own perspective. Uh, it's going to backfire most of the time. Try to pay attention to, um, to your own facial expression and tone of voice, because what you, you project is going to get reflected back at you. So you're best to be calm and patient. Again, this idea of taking a deep breath and counting to three before approaching a situation because um, the person can feel your tension or they can feel your patient understanding and they're going to reflect that back to you um, when they communicate with you. And then again, um, can't emphasize this enough, take the time to communicate. Give yourself and that person enough time to, um, to respond and to interact and um, most of all to connect with each other. Okay, um, in this video, we have Rebecca talking about adjusting her own thoughts and responses when her mother repeated herself. She could sense my frustration because occasionally I would lose my patience and I, I would bark at her. Why are you asking me that question again? I just answered that question two minutes ago. And then she would get frustrated because, you know, she was very old school and she said, like, don't disrespect me. And I didn't ask you that question two minutes ago. It's a new question. So phase two of our relationship was like, okay, that's a new question. I'll answer it again. Okay, so again, very good points that uh, Rebecca has made there. Um, it can be frustrating for, for everyone when someone who's living with dementia repeats question statements or behaviors. This is really one of the most common behaviors that you see in the middle stage of the disease, so you should expect it. And um, again, it, it kind of relates to what I mentioned before is the loss of the short-term memory. Literally, the person cannot remember what they just said a moment ago, and that's why they're repeating themselves. And they're not doing it 
to be irritating or frustrating. Um, but you know, it's only natural um, that a, a caregiver may feel that way. So again, this this idea of take a deep breath, one, two, three, um, you know, and and just and just plan ahead and and be ready for for that kind of um, behavior to happen. And um, another important point is um, not to try and convince a person about what you remember happening a moment before or or what you see happening in the moment there. Um, it really helps to accept that the person is not going to remember the situation the same way you do, and they may not perceive the current situation the same way you do. So just really try to accept that his or her perspective and um, respond to the situation from that standpoint. Okay, um, so the best way to do that then is what we call joining the person's reality. So when you join the person's reality, you're going to take that time to try and see the world as he or she might be seeing it right at that moment. Um, and that's not necessarily that easy to do, um, but, but it's really about trying. So when, when the world is seen from his or her perspective, their behavior may actually become more understandable to you. And due to the changes that are taking place in that person's brain, you know, the changes that come with the disease, um, they're probably not going to be able to see your perspective. So you're going to be have to be the one that's going to use that respect and that empathy, empathy to see the world through their eyes. Joining that person's reality then is the key um, to helping the person have his or her say, and it provides, um, you know, soothing reassurance to them. So some of the ways you can do that, we kind of list out the steps here on the slide. So listen to figure out what the person wants or needs. And that's going to mean, especially in the middle stage, paying attention to both the words and the behavior of that person. Um, and keep in mind that they may be saying something about their feelings or needs, uh, but they may be feeling something else on a deeper level that also needs attention from you. So, you know, you may hear I can still drive just fine, but there may also be that feeling, um, deeper feeling, I don't want to give up my independence, don't take that away from me. Um, and, uh, or, or like, uh, stop taking over my life, I hate it. You know, that that's really potentially a reflection of, I hate this disease and I don't understand why I can't do now what I always could. So let the person know um, that you understand what they may be feeling and why, um, whether they're expressing that through their words or behavior or both. And then um, try to answer any question or address any issue that they may bring up, um, but try to do that by being brief and to the point um, so, that, so that you're not uh, causing more confusion. Um, and then respond to the emotions behind the behavior or the concern. So if that person's communicating with words, you might say, um, you seem sad, do you feel sad? And then wait for a response. And if the person says yes, you may want to guess the cause as like, do you miss the way things used to be? And if the person says yes to this as well, you say, I do too. And then you've made a connection. But remember we're, you know, we're really trying to um, make the communication as easy as possible for them. So we're not saying, tell me why you feel bad. We're, we're really trying to give them something that they can respond positively or negatively to. Um, you know, the person may be communicating through behavior. So then it's a little bit more of a detective work to try and identify and speak about the emotion behind the behavior. You may see someone say rummaging through their possessions. Well, they might be trying to communicate boredom, or they may be needing to find something, um, or maybe needing to, to feel like they have a purpose going on. Um, other things can, lots of other things can happen. Hitting during bathing um, can mean a lot of different things. Maybe the water's too hot, it's too cold, maybe they don't feel comfortable being naked. Uh, so, so it's not that easy to, to figure it out, but um, there's a lot of detective work in that. And after you've tried to respond to the emotions that that person is expressing, then you really want to reassure and redirect the person um, to do something that, that um, may shift their thinking and behavior. So something more positive. And, and we call this redirection. 
Um, so to continue the above example, um, after you know making that connection emotionally, you can say, I'm glad to be here with you today. Let's go for a walk outside. And that way you're um, gradually moving the person from feeling sad to doing something active that might lift their spirits again. So there was a lot um, in this slide. And I just want to mention that um, there's, there's a lot of um, content here that we go over in more detail uh, in another Alzheimer's presentation called Understanding and Responding to Dementia-Related Behavior. Uh, the, the steps that you see here are, form part of a framework that we describe in that presentation that can help you um, address those behaviors that can be really um, challenging to, to deal with. So I just wanna encourage you, if you're really um, interested in more of, of this stage of the disease that um, you, you might want to uh, to attend an understanding and responding to dementia related behavior presentation from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, okay, just some more, you know, uh, some more approaches that that you can take and we've mentioned most of these before. Um, keep it slow and basic use those short sentences take your time, be patient. The more you slow down, the less resistance you're going to encounter uh, because the person won't feel rushed and unable to keep pace. Um, rushing, again, leaves that person feeling frustrated and inadequate, upset with him or herself, and then resistant to you. So again, by taking your time, you really uh, are going to avoid frustration for everybody. Um, so, Sometimes we say guess or fill in words, um, sometimes helps to offer the choice that you think would be best at the end of a sentence. So in, rather than saying, what would you like for breakfast? You can say it's breakfast time. Would you like eggs or oatmeal? And um, that's kind of something we had referred to earlier. You know, we try not to ask the person to come up with a description of, of what they're feeling or what they need, but rather try and give them options that they can say yes or no to. Uh, other, uh, other approaches so can help to um, give as many possible cues as you can. So visual cues and gestures, avoid sudden movement, as we mentioned before, gentle gestures and pointing, but try to avoid, you know, the sudden gestures that may startle the person. Um, you can use any mnemonic device that you want to help people keep oriented and remember where they are. So write things down. Uh, use reminder notes, put up a calendar, label things, lists uh, can remind the person, you know, of, of where things belong or what needs to be done and who is who in that person's life. Um, on photos, you can write the names of the people in the photo on the back of the photo so they can flip it over and, and, and keep track of, of, you know, who those people are. Um, and then uh, again, as we mentioned before, you can, you know, try to kind of plant the answer to the question within the question itself. So it's much easier to answer a question, um, yes or no, if, if you know, than an open-ended question. So don't say, what would you like for lunch, Bill? Um, say instead, Bill, I'm making sandwiches for lunch. Would you like ham or turkey? And they can choose one or the other. And if they're still stuck, then you can say, how about ham? Again, you're really just trying to make it as easy as possible for that person to communicate back to you. Um, plan to repeat information or questions. Uh, as we mentioned before, you, you know, this is one of the most common behaviors. You're gonna, you're gonna hear questions over and over again. You're gonna repeat conversations over and over again. And, and that is, um, that's just a reflection of the, the memory loss that that person is experiencing. Uh, it can help to try to turn negatives into positives or um, so to kind of <coughs> connect something that the person may not want to do with, with something that they would be excited about. So instead of saying, it's time to go get your shower, you can say, um, let's go get you cleaned up for the day so you'll be ready for Cindy's visit this afternoon. Um, and then just uh, try to avoid quizzing the person or trying to ask them to, to re, you know, try and remember harder, um, asking them to think again, you know, it's, it's all unfair and it, and it really doesn't work. So 
trying, asking someone to try harder just leads to frustration. And it's more respectful and helpful to give the person the information they need for a task or a situation along with reminders as needed. Um, you know, we, it's important to respond, to try and connect with the person, right? So respond empathetically and reassure them that you're there to help, that you're there and listening, that you hear their concerns. The facts in any of these situations are far less important than the person's feelings um, or their view of reality. So whatever they think is happening, whatever they think they're seeing, whatever they remember happening, all of that is very real to that person, even though it may not match your reality. Um, so if you really kind of respond to the feelings that they are experiencing because of their perception of reality first, um, that's going to help avoid resistance. Let them know that you're there, you're together and safe, you're there to help, that you hear and understand their thoughts and feelings. And, and really, as long as there's no safety issue, just go with the flow and try to find common ground wherever possible. Um, if there are safety concerns, make you know adjustments to the situation or the environment. Um, and then uh, once you've done all of that, redirect the person to another activity if necessary. So that was a lot of um, a lot of information. This is actually the end of our section on the middle stage. Um, I do see some questions have popped up. Sorry, Anna. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is from Jackie. Uh, I have a mom with me currently. I have my mom with me currently. She is go here going through cataract surgery. Her husband calls her intoxicated, telling her he is coming to get her and her surgery is not finished. She, uh, Jackie has plane tickets ready to take her home. Her mom has moderate vascular dementia. I explained to her I already have plans to take her home. Uh, it sounds like Jackie is struggling because her husband, her mom's husband gets her more confused than she already is. Wow. Okay. So that sounds I'm sorry like, to hear that, Jackie. I know. I'm sorry too. This is so this is sounds like a, a pretty complicated um situation. I, I'm not sure was there a question in, in there? Um I think maybe some uh some tips on help for communicating to her mom, maybe even her, her mom's husband. Yeah. Um so I don't I don't want I feel like this is a complicated enough situation and, and not knowing the people involved, I, I don't know that I could sort of offer a one sentence um, advice. What I would suggest um, is, or, or what I would say to you is that you're not alone in facing this kind of a complex situation. There are a lot of other um, caregivers out there and um, they, you know, a lot of them connect through the Alzheimer's Association uh, on the website. Uh, I'll, I'll share some um, resources at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, but I also want to, I generally um, also suggest this, is if you're really feeling um, like overwhelmed or you don't really know where to start, there is an 800 number that is a 24 seven hotline that the Alzheimer's Association um, has. And it is, it's staffed with, uh, with experienced clinicians 24 seven. So you can call this, this hotline with pretty much any question and they'll either be able to kind of give you direct advice or they'll be able to direct you to the resource that can help you. So um, I'll just take the opportunity to mention that. And we do have that also later in the presentation, but the number is 1-800-272-3900. Um, um, so again, if you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's a great place to get started. And, and you can, um, you can either connect with say other, you know, other, other caregivers to share ideas, or you can get some advice from those, um, clinicians who are on the hotline. So Ariana is the phone number 1-800-272-3700. 3900 or the last. 3900. I'm just putting it in the chat now so yeah and, yeah and it is um in the in, in the presentation toward toward the end we have some resources which include um include that number so it's in this presentation 
Yeah. And then also in the chat, uh, Ariana mentioned um, a program that she recommends for more of a deep dive into conversations and uh, uh, it's understanding responding to dementia related behavior. The library, the San Anselmo Library will have that on Wednesday, September 14th at 10 a.m. And I have put the link in the chat if you'd like to register for that as well. Great. So Chloe has two questions. Um, one is how will we how will we be able to access slash share this video after today? Um, the video I'm going to upload it to our YouTube channel. So it'll be there um, as well. But I'm also going to email it to everybody who registered for the program. So uh, you can share uh, one, the link once you receive the email or you can find us on YouTube and it'll be there hopefully later today, but maybe tomorrow. Depends on how long it takes the video to um, download and then upload. <laughs> And then Chloe's second question is, at what point would reading written messages become difficult and more confusing? Um, so I, as a general um, answer, I would say this middle stage of the disease, but uh, I'm gonna have to, you know, <laughs> be a little bit lawyerly to, and say that there's not a bright line moment when you know you've gone from the early to the middle stage and everybody progresses differently through the disease. So, so um, you know, some people live with and progressively through the disease for, you know, 15 years. For some people, it's a much shorter journey. And um, therefore, it, it makes it difficult for me to say, you know, when, when exactly this should happen. But that's really where it's about trying to stay connected with that person um, and, and see what you observe, because you're the one who knows them better than anybody. And um, uh, so, <laughs> so I'm sorry, maybe that's not that helpful, but, but generally speaking, the middle stage of the disease is when you would start having problems with written communication. All right, great. Thank you, Ayana. That's all for questions so far. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to move on to the late stage of the disease, um, also called the severe stage. Uh, and again, there's a really um, significant difference between the middle and the late stage of the disease. So by the time someone is in the late stage, they're really not using words to speak. They may use just a few words. Um, they, you know, they might be able to respond to familiar words or phrases, um, but you're going to have to really expect to change again the way that you're really connecting and communicate, communicating with that person because that person still needs to connect and communicate, even if they can't really speak, even if they have can't really even move. So, you know, by this stage, the person may have lost a lot. Of it, 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 like just general activities of daily living that they can't do anymore. And um, with it, with, with caregivers, then there's sometimes that feeling of like, what can I do? What can I do? And uh, what we want to say here is that really um, your presence, your connection with that person are much more important at this stage of the disease than trying to do something specific for that person. And something also very important to keep in mind, you know, that person is an adult and that sense of self that we talked about, that continues even throughout this late stage of the disease. So what you can really do is to try and connect with the, the aspects of that person's self that you, that you can honor, like remembering that person's history, respecting his or her preferences. And you're really just trying to help that person feel um, content and happy whenever possible. So keep talking, you know, you use familiar words and names and phrases, um, use poems and songs. Um, you may or may not get a direct response from that person, but the sound of your voice is gonna be really instrumental in maintaining a connection between you. Um, and in that sense, we really want to try and use all five senses as a way to connect with that person. You know, the touch, sight, sound, smell, taste, um, all of this is, is what we can really tap into to try and help connect 
um, with that person at this stage of the disease. Um, so in this video, Sandra is going to talk about connecting with her mother in the late stage. I know that my mom feels aggravated. I know that she feels alone. I know that she feels confused. And I know on any given day, I don't know if I've made it better for her. I try. In these later stages, I've come to recognize that being really aware of the five senses is really important. Touch seems to give her a great deal of comfort. I know when I come over, I'm going to brush her hair all the time. And my husband noted to me recently, he said, you know, you should see the look on your mom's face when you're brushing her hair. She's just happy. She's just happy. She doesn't say a lot. And I do it for a long period of time. I comb it, I braid it, I do funny things with it, but it just allows me to just be with her in a way that makes her feel comfortable. So I always find this really touching, you know, the, the image of, of Sandra gently brushing her, her mother's hair. Uh, but it's really a good demonstration of what we're trying to say that you're at that point, you're really just trying to connect and that you can use the five senses to help you make that connection. I know that my mom. Okay. Um, okay, so connecting through touch. Um, you know, some ideas are here. You can feel the different fabrics identified by touch. Um, a gentle hand massage with lotion can, can be very comforting and soothing to someone. Uh, what I would say is just, you wanna always be um, I, uh, cognizant of a couple of different issues. One is um, whether that person has any kind of sensitivity to ingredients in the hand lotion. So um, just keep that in mind and in, in your choice of, of using a lotion. Also keep in mind um, that uh, the, the skin um, is, is very delicate and, and tears easily. Um, bruising is, happens very easily as well. So whatever kind of touch, um, just keep it gentle and, um, and, and be, just be aware that um, you, you can cause an injury more easily than you would with uh, a younger person, um, someone who has you know, more fat under their skin uh, than, than somebody who's at the late stage of Alzheimer's and is elderly. Through sight, um, we got some, again, some suggestions here, like laminating brightly covered colored pictures to look at and, and looking at videos and photos together. Um, remember what we said before is that there is a loss of, of peripheral vision and, um, and then there's generally going to be, um, on, at, in the very late stages, um, a loss of, of sight in general, like a deterioration of, of sight. Um, the person may also have, you know, macular degeneration or other sight issues. So it helps to try and, um, keep, a very strong color, um, color distinctions between color contrast. For example, if someone is sitting at a table and you want them to eat, then it helps to have a placemat um, and that is a very different color from the plate so that they can see the round shape of the plate with the food on it. And then that connection that, oh, this is a plate with food and, and I should be eating now that you can help kind of trigger that, that understanding. Connecting through sound, um, actually, familiar music ha is one of the most powerful ways to connect with someone who may be otherwise uh, appearing unresponsive or almost unresponsive. Um, you know, music is one of those very, very kind of ingrained old memories that stays with someone even as they're losing the, the more short term or more recent memories. Um, if you have never seen the video called Alive Inside, I highly recommend watching it. It's really um, very uh, impressive and, and touching when you see someone who appears completely unresponsive, hear that music that they loved or, or a musician hearing, you know, the music that they used to play and how they come alive and respond to that music. So very, very powerful. 
And um, also keep in mind, you know, that you may be, um, the person may not be understanding the words you're saying. So the gentle tone of your voice is, is a lot of the connection that's happening here when you're talking with someone um, or, or, you know, reading to them or reading poems or singing songs. Uh, sense of smell is one of our most basic senses. And um, when, in general, when, when we get older, our sense of smell does diminish. Um, so if you want to connect through smell, you're probably going to need to use smells that are uh, a bit stronger than, than, than you might um, respond to. Uh, so the other thing to keep in mind, again, is, is whether somebody has a sensitivity to any um, kind of particular smell. So if you want to use um, a, a fragrant lotion for a hand massage, just make sure it's, it's a fragrance that they find appealing. Um, again, with the sensitivity of the skin, make sure that it's not something that they're going to react badly to. Um, but, but scents that are familiar and pleasant, uh, something that somebody remembers, right? The apple pie, chicken soup, you know, those good smells from our childhood um, can really um, create a, a positive emotion in that person. Um, just, just keep in mind, you know, whether they have any allergies or issues. Um, and again, so similarly, taste and smell are very inextricably linked. And really, even into the late stage, people with living with dementia do often enjoy tasting their favorite foods and their, their flavors, you know, those familiar flavors from their childhood. Um, one thing to be very aware of, though, again, in the very late stages, as, as various functions, you're losing various functions, a lot of people start to experience um, a diminished ability to swallow. So you really need to be aware of where they are in that. Um, it may be that um, foods that they need to chew and swallow are not no longer safe. Um, so that's just something to be aware of and, and make sure that you're only providing foods that they can uh, swallow safely. Um, so that, I'll, I'll just go ahead and uh, wrap up the, the presentation here, um, and we'll ask for questions at the end, so don't worry. Um, but to summarize, maximizing our communication or connectedness with a person who's living with dementia um, involves adhering to a few principles, which are the ones we've tried to emphasize in this presentation. Um, do try to understand um, what is and isn't possible to change and by understanding all that you can about the disease and the disease progression. Uh, you can stay up to date with the latest information and scientific breakthroughs um, on Alzheimer's and other dementias um, by attending workshops and conferences. And the website, again, is a great, um, the Alzheimer's Association website is a great resource for this information. Um, that's going to help you know and accept the cognitive and functional limitations that a person uh, um, is, ex is experiencing, and that's going to help you set realistic expectations for that person. Keep in mind that that person is an adult with a sense of self, and that should always be respected. And you want to use feelings to connect with that person you convey your uh, mood through your actions and your tone of voice. Um, and the person's gonna pick up on those and reflect them back to you. So try to stay focused on your positive feelings for that person to increase your understanding of his or her reality and demonstrate your caring. That's also gonna help you connect with that person. Um, it's not that easy, but really listen, observe and try to decode what that person is communicating about their needs and their wants. And by joining in their reality, um, you can better understand what's needed and, and how best to intervene. Um, communication evolves throughout the stages of Alzheimer's disease and adapting to those changes requires commitment. Um, by adjusting your communication as the disease progresses, you can learn to um, connect more deeply with the person that you care for. This is our last video, and in this video, um, Dr. Sam Fazio of the Alzheimer's Association's Home Office describes the multiple effects of not caring for yourself as a caregiver. So self-care self -care is extremely important. 
taking care of yourself while you care for somebody with the disease um, not only impacts your own health, but it really can impact the person with the disease. So for example, if you're not getting enough sleep, you might be easily irritated, which will then um, sort of spill over to your interactions with the person with the disease and, and maybe being short with them, which then might cause them to get frustrated. So it's not only important to take care of yourself for your own health, but really for you to really be a good caregiver. So just to reiterate, caring for yourself while you care for someone else can have an effect on both you and the person living with the disease. Um, and you can provide better care for the person with dementia if you're well rested and taking care of your physical and emotional needs. Take it. Okay. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning or earlier in the presentation about this 24 seven helpline. Um, here's the number again. And um, as I described before, this is a great place to start if you are, um, if you're not sure where to start um, or if, you, if you're feeling overwhelmed, uh, they're gonna help you uh, navigate the resources that are available to you and, and try and get you the answers and the support that, that you need. And then educational programs, you're obviously attending one of those today. Um, if you've been, uh, in, maybe you attended some of the earlier presentations in the series that the San Anselmo um, Library is putting on, um, but the, these are some of them and, and you can also um, find them on the website. So if you, they're, they're offered regularly, um, these presentations live in this kind of Zoom format. And um, now finally, we are also doing the presentations in person um, in some cases as well. And on the um, communityresourcefinder.org, uh, you can search for um, resources in your local community, um, like living services, day programs, medical resources. Um, so this is a way to kind of tap into what's in your local community and available to you. Um, Alts Connected is um, a way to connect with other uh, caregivers. So it's an online community for caregivers and for people living with dementia, um, but it has um, message boards and there's uh, um, over 50,000 people out there who are sharing their, their thoughts and their questions and their ideas with each other um, through Alts Connected. And then um, finally, there's Alzheimer's Navigator, um, which is actually just a tool to help you kind of start to put together um, a caregiving plan. So this is a great place to visit when you first um, get the diagnosis and you need to try and, um, you know, grapple with all the different aspects of, of what's coming with the progression of the disease and the, the navigator can help you with that. Okay, so that is, um, that's our presentation for today. Do we have any further questions, Suriana? Yeah, there's one more in the, um, in the Q&A right now. It's from Chloe. When you talk about joining their reality, does that include agreeing if they believe things that are upsetting or thinking that you are a different person? Okay, so that is a great question. And um, the short answer is yes. Um, we... Uh, so the, when, when, they're, um, when, when someone has experienced something that we believe is not in line with reality, we, we call that you know, confabulation. Um, and for you to join in their reality means kind of going with the flow of, of what they're saying. Um, it's, um, it, it can be a little hard to, to maybe to picture until you're actually um, experiencing it, but um, if you're familiar with um, improv, um, that's one way to kind of think about it. So the, the premise behind improv is one person wow. says something to the other person and the other person takes that and says, yes, and, and they, they, so, so there's never like a, a pushback or a rejection of what the other person said. You always kind of take it and move further with it. So, you know, um, oh, the, yes, there's monkeys out there playing in the tree. Don't, aren't they having a lot of fun, you know? And really, as long as there isn't 
a safety issue, um, it, the, the net effect of going along with that person's reality is going to be is going to be better than um, trying to convince them that they're wrong about something. I hope that makes sense. Okay, hey, I'm not. Uh... I'm seeing one more question in the q and A. I'm going to let more people type if they have any more questions. Um, I just want to in also put in the chat, uh, the San Isamo Library has another upcoming program. It's not with the Alzheimer's Association this month. That's that's the September 14th one. Ours is going to be on, on uh, this next program is Wednesday, August 24th at 12 p.m. It's Avoiding Scams, Fraud, and Identity, identity Theft. It, it's geared towards... Um, uh, stopping elder abuse. So if you're interested in that, I'm putting the link to register in the chat there as well. So our next question is, oh, it's just, it's Chloe. She's saying thank you. So you answered her question, it sounds like. <laughs> All right, any others? If anyone has any more questions, now is the time to ask. I am not seeing anything. So I'm going to end our recording. Bye-bye, YouTube land. Thank you for joining us.